Welcome to the campfire, my friend. Pour yourself a cup and join us today as we talk camping, history, gear, and more with one and only Blackie Thomas. Today's video is sponsored by the Camp Crafters Cookbook with more than 90 tried and true recipes used by the historic campers between 1890 and 1927, cultivated and tested by yours truly. Click the link in the description or show notes to get yours today and by our Patreons whose generosity and friendship literally makes this show possible. Consider joining to get some insider perks. Now, Mr. Thomas is joining us all the way from uh, from Alabama, and uh, we're so thankful for him to join us. And sir, I have been a long time fan ever since I started learning a little bit about historic camp crafting. You've had some great videos talking about scouting gear and just even just even artifacts in general. Of course, a military surplus. So thank you so much for joining me today on our campfire chat. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So we're going to start off, man. So tell us, where did you start your, your camping journey? Were you, were you into it as a kid? Did you go out camping with your family? I was very much into it as a child. Um, I actually had a couple of bad birth defects and I didn't learn to walk until I was five. And so I sat and listened to the old members of my family tell stories about hunting, fishing, war stories, and et cetera, these grand adventures they had been on. And when I got to where I could get out there, plus, like a lot of people of my generation, Walt Disney, Davy Crockett, I got motivated because of that. And I wanted to get out and see it. So that was the, the beginning of all of it. No kidding. Now, was your family pretty involved in taking you camping? Actually, no. Uh, my family was relatively poor, and they had grown up having to do this. They didn't see it as something to enjoy. It was a memory of the Great Depression and hard times to them. So my dad never took me camping. I did it on my own or through friends. Okay. So, so at what point in your your age did you actually uh, go out with your friends without any adults then were you really young were you a teenager eight eight years old going out camping yeah. with just your friends yeah we went into a pasture of one of my friend's grandfather and camped out in the pasture overnight no kidding yeah now, now you're uh your fans who listen to you 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 reminisce quite a bit about mm -hmm. the influences on your life especially like the veterans uh mm -hmm. so is that at what age did you really start learning from the the veterans then was it eight years old like your uncle or something or it later? was it was actually earlier than that it was oh from the time i was five or whatever on i mean you'd go to a family gathering and all the old men would get off to the side and out would come the pocket knives and they'd start whittling. Well, of course, little Blackie is right there, you know, and their stories and things like that. And I was five and my grandfather gave me my first pocket knife. And uh, so I could sit and whittle with the old men and listen to their stories. And how do you do this? I was a ton of questions. You know, why did you do this? How did you do that? And they tolerated me really well it often shocked them why do you want to know how to butcher a hog boy you know it just it was interesting you know it was the pioneer stuff it was davy crockett it was daniel boone it was all of that and so and then of course hunting was a big part of the family and so even at that young age you're going along with the hunts to tote the croaker sack so when the older men shoot the rabbits and squirrels and stuff your job is to play dog and tote it so i got to go along on those so they had fishing same thing just always out there. What was your uh, favorite thing to hunt? I, I got to ask, being a hunter myself. Squirrels. Oh, no kidding, man. Yeah. <laughs> I was really good on squirrels. What time does the, the season start down there? Uh, squirrel season starts in Alabama back in those days in September. Uh, okay. And then it runs all the way through late February. You learn a lot from squirrel hunting. You get to be a good crack shot and, uh, you know, being quiet and tracking through your woods and everything. That's a... It's a good way to start for sure, and I still love it. Well, it was a rite of passage because when you were 
calm enough or would listen well enough to go along with the men squirrel hunting. And, you know, children are like beagles. They just got to. So you carried the sack to tote the stuff. From that, eventually they determined that you were calm enough that you would be sat down at the tree with grandfather or uncle or dad over here on this side of the tree and you're on this side of the tree with a single shot you shoot squirrels that way i shoot squirrels that way and you got to see how well they handle the gun uh that way adult supervision was always there to take charge at any moment and uh it was a rite of passage to be able to go hunting by yourself and things like that i was i think 11 when i was trusted to go hunting by myself before that always had to be with a group that's a big deal it was that's a really big deal my uh 13 year old i don't think and, and he's pretty responsible and, and i'm really not that protective of a parent but i know my wife wouldn't let my my son go hunting even at 13 years old by himself and i don't know if i'd be too comfortable with it that's a lot of trust it was a different time and a different era and we were poor you know and you were expected to pull your weight even as a child you know at family doings or whatever the kids didn't just go in another room and play granny had you stirring mm -hmm. something or peeling something or you did not not participate in family activity so it was a all-in-one thing you were constantly learning and speaking of 13 um whenever the school was getting out for the summer and i had read a book by eric severide called the uh canoeing the cree and it so inspired mm -hmm. me that i asked my best friend i said we need to canoe the choctahatchee river all the way to the gulf that's 185 miles and so i talked him into it two other young men into it and then talked the parents into it and so <laughs> one of the parents dropped us off at the headwaters and seven days later we came out at fort walton beach um down there there were no adults i was the oldest i was 13. so 11 oh, 12 wow. and 13 was the ages we were just expected to be that kind of independent back then you know all of us had a shotgun or a 22. you know it, you were just expected by that age you know to be independent by 13 you should be able to run a tractor you know <laughs> literally that, that kind of reminds me of a, a rite of passage. I, I'm involved in scouts mm -hmm. uh, pretty heavily. And back in the day, earning your first class rank told everybody that you were a qualified camper. And mm -hmm. it's not allowed anymore, but you used to have patrols of first class scouts and above that'd be willing, able to go out and go camping without their scout master, assistant scout masters. And it's mm -hmm. just a, a it kind of your experience is a testament to that that mindset. And for the most part, it, it's not like there's a bunch of kids that got killed from that experience. So it must not have been too bad. Mm -mm. But uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a change in times. Well, looking at the Boy Scout manual from the 1940s. And uh, part of being the first class scout was, if I remember correctly, you had to start at point X, go seven miles cross country making your own map as you went mm -hmm. then had to come back to another fixed point seven more miles and then you had to hand that map off to your scout master and he had to be able to retrace your path and if he couldn't follow your map you failed now understand we're telling a child without adult supervision is going to navigate 14 miles through woods with no adult supervision yeah. Parents today would freak out. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. <laughs> Were you a scout yourself at some point? I actually was not a scout as a child. I wanted to really, really bad, but it just never worked out. Um, there was no troop around me. And um, I got involved with it as an adult. A, my mentor, Francis McGowan, who I call Grouch, was a scout master for like 30 years. And he brought me into scouts and eventually I was on the round table committee and I went and became a shooting sports mm -hmm. director uh, for the local Boy Scout camp here, Camp Alaflow, for several years. 
So you were you were a scout leader, and I know that you've explained in a couple of your videos because people will ask you about your hat. And I remember one particular video a, a year or two ago because you're actually looking for another identical hat because you really like that style. This is a Boy Scout Explorers Scout Master hat from the early 1990s, and I already have two of them, this one and another one. So I am I am set up with it, but um, I got it because I had had an earlier hat that had uh, disappeared. Someone had liberated it, and so I replaced Aww. it with this one, and it's crushable felt, you know, and uh, I wanted something when I was the shooting sports director at the camp that the kids, I want to be able to look all the way across camp and recognize me. And uh, so everybody else was wearing baseball caps and Blackie wore this. And uh, it really worked. It helped out. And I fell in love with the hat and have had it ever since. So you uh, stay pretty loyal to whatever gear that you find works out for you. If it you works, find something I stay with it until something better comes mm -hmm. along. I think that's some practical knowledge and advice, honestly. Mm -hmm. I, chasing the, the shiniest, newest thing can get pretty exhausting mm -hmm. you know, when you have something that just suits you, your style, and your needs. And very expensive chasing that newest piece of gear. Often it's the old piece of gear is one that you end up hanging on to and keep coming back to again and again, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Me too. I agree. So are you still getting involved in scouts here and there, helping out a troop or a day camp or a summer camp or anything like that? I have for the last couple of years. There's a local troop here that I have uh, several family members that have children in there. And they have brought me in to be a guest speaker and things like that a few times. And I'm always willing to help out. That's awesome. Uh, we really need, and I, I told this to many people, but if we don't get the youth interested and involved and invested by the time that they're adults and they get the, the right to vote when it comes time to voting for state parks, city parks or whatever, they're not going to have an interest and it's not going to mean something to them. Yeah. So any outdoor program, 4-H, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, whatever it is, I think it's pretty important that we try to extend the flame, if you will. That's the very reason Teddy Roosevelt created all these parks. He did not want them to be wiped out you know, all the timber cut, all the mountains mined out. He wanted another generation to experience wilderness if they wanted to, to have land mm -hmm. they could go wander and camp and sit by a stream and fish and hunt. And that's the reason he created all the national forests, national parks, etc. In some part, he was part of, you know, the bigger picture. But if we don't get the generations out there to see it and experience it for their own, they'll go away. There's no need for them then. You know, you train a lot of adults. Um, some of them, or I'm sure most of them, especially uh, your Silver Wolves group, probably have quite a bit of experience already as they kind of mm -hmm. uh, get higher level education and training from you. But if there's someone who's just starting out or at least interested in camping, what what's some general advice that you would give them just to get outdoors? Well, the number one skill I tell them to learn first is how to build a fire. Even if you're not interested in long distance hikes or big camp outs, learn that basic skill. With that, you can heat up water, heat up food, build a campfire to have light and see and warmth. Even if you're just going to, Come out of your car, sit here for a couple hours, put the fire out and go home. I start mm -hmm. with that. To me, that is the threshold of being able to come out. Because once you can be comfortable around the fire, building the fire, understanding how the fire works, then these other things like putting up a hammock, putting up a tent. How do you build a campground? How do you cook on a fire? Those spiral away from that fire and increase and become a camp. But if you can't build that fire, mm -hmm. you can't build a camp, at least in my experience. I, I can agree with that. And building a fire is very accessible, I think, to most people who even has a, a grill on their back porch. You don't have to go too far. I tell people, especially when they're wanting to learn a ferro rod, 
Start with toilet paper. Super simple, just wad up a wad, practice the strikes, getting the sparks, how to focus the sparks. It'll go whoosh, stomp it out, do another pile. And it's repetition, muscle memory, becoming comfortable with it. When you're absolutely bored with doing it with toilet paper, okay, now shift over to cotton. That's cheap. Guy, get your thing of cotton balls. Start with that. And you learn step by step um, until you can make a fire you know, with matches, with a lighter. Each one has their advantages. I've had several people tell me I have no use for matches. I'll just use a lighter. And I'll point out mm -hmm. sometimes when the wind is cold and blowing, and you can't get that lighter to stay lit because of the wind. You can take a, a tender bundle, get up here and strike the match and shove the match into the tender bundle and have both hands to shield around it. And that match will sit there and burn by itself. It doesn't need fingers to work. it. Mm -hmm. So it does have an advantage, especially those um, lifeboat matches. Once it's struck, it's going. And uh, so I carry matches, lighter, ferro rod, Fresnel lens, multiple sources with me. For that reason, what's convenient? What do I feel like lighting with? Yeah, sometimes it's just kind of fun uh, to take out the flint and steel or ferro, or even like you said, the lens, uh, just to kind of brush up on it. I was trying to get a flint and steel fire going uh, this summer, and um, it's been a while since I had done it. I had my char cloth and everything. I was like, you know what? Let, let's see if I can get this going again. And I didn't anticipate at how damp, just the humidity here in Ohio, mm -hmm. sometimes the humidity gets so high, it's insane, mm -hmm. that even just the humidity made it very difficult getting the char cloth lit with a cold. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it struck me then, and it's like, man, you know what? I actually need to brush up on this skill a lot more. And if I was out in the woods or something with just this, I was going to freeze or go hungry that night. <laughs> mm-hmm. I live in an area of Alabama that's about an hour and 20 minutes from the, the Gulf Coast. And because of that, our humidity is unusually high here. Well, like, for example, a bow drill fire. You do everything right, and you generate that coal, and you watch that coal just go out. The dampness in the air will put the coal out right in front of your eyes. So I don't deal a lot with those. I can do them in the winter pretty easy. <clears throat> but when the humidity is over 80%, you're fighting, really fighting. You have to generate a huge coal, and you're working like a madman trying to keep that heat. And you just watch it go just like that and just fade right in front of your eyes. So where you're at, you know, uh, what kind of fire skills you have to incorporate up there in Ohio, like you're saying, you've got the lake effect and everything coming off the lakes. You get big bands of humidity like we do down here. We're even striking a match, the thing will go out, you know, because the humidity is so thick at that moment. It will drop down. And what if you could see it through a microscope, the air is so laden with moisture around that flame, the air actually turns to steam, the moisture turns to steam, and that robs heat. And so fire works on the three-legged stool of heat, fuel, and, of course, fire. You take away the heat, it just goes right out in front of your face. No, that, that example that you have, uh, just guiding us through that, reminded me of a, another video that you did that I was really impressed with and how you uh, educate people. You were talking about uh, the placement of a tent and the hills and the wind and a wind sink and all these other things. You have a really good way of explaining uh, a concept, not just by you do it this way because that's what the book says. You actually go a step farther and uh, explain it as to how and why. You know, I think that is so important because you just demonstrated that you may have a skill, but you can't always use that skill based on the time or environment that you're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being in a uh, situation where, and you, you've experienced it up there because you're in snow country, rain fog, where it's just so much moisture in the air. from It's raining, but there's an unusual like fog ability at the same time. 
It's so much sheer small droplets in the air. Any kind of flame just goes out like that. Even a lighter held against bone dry tinder may or may not ignite. It may go out. Your your style of education, the style of training that you do, where, where did you learn that from? Was that just from trial and error or were you formally trained? Were you a manager or, or how did you build those skills? All of the above. Um, I have five degrees and I've been a district manager for a major company. I worked for a uh, government contractor that built military and weather radars for several years. Um, I've self-taught in a lot of things. Plus, I had a lot of really good teachers. And it, my grandfather, I think, would be the best point of this. Um, his philosophy was, show me what you know, and then I'll show you what you don't know. And so... I can, you know, to me, and one of the things I stress in the teaching is, what's the difference between a teacher and an instructor? A teacher assumes you have no knowledge of the topic. An instructor is he's showing you a new way to do something you already know how to do. And it's a better way or more efficient way. And so when I approach a teaching, mm -hmm. like a, a student that I haven't met before, I will, I don't want to immediately leap straight into it. I want to talk to them a little bit on general topics, get an idea of their thought processes, how comfortable they are, how well they can interact with discussion and et cetera. So to sit there and look at it, you would think that I'm just talking, but actually I'm feeling out the student, how best to interact with the student, say. And then once I have an idea of how I should progress, then I will go, do I need to start here or do I need to start here? See, and if I start there and they don't quite get it, do I need to drop back down or just keep going and they'll catch up? It really it depends on the student. And I evaluate each student at just like that. If I'm talking to one student or 30, and uh, the first thing we did when we did the Silver Wolves class, this other week in Ohio was day one was just to get there, set up camp, and then we're going to sit around and talk. We didn't immediately jump into classes. One, you're tired. You've been traveling. So to sit down, relax, and get some interaction between the instructors and the students to get to understand where we're at, what level we need to be talking at. Then when we hit it on Saturday, I had a much better idea of how to right. approach this group how to talk to them. If I had just gone in blind with a pre-set up, here's how we're going to do it. It may work. It may not. So I'm a very adaptable, you know, I I can teach on just about any level given time. Give me a few minutes to talk to you and I'll tell you where we're at, so to speak. Or as my granddaddy said, right. show me what you know and I'll show you what you don't know. So it's a very personalized approach. It, I assume well, as a teacher, I can tell you that that works really well in small groups. But when you have a group of like 30, mm -hmm. how do you get that same kind of uh, approach to work? What, how, how, what, what's your, uh, your methodology okay. in that? Okay, out of any group dynamic, you have 10% that are advanced and are bored. 10% who are actually a little behind and are lost. 80% right. that will muddle right along with you. So my first couple of, if I, if I took over a class, uh, back up a little bit. When I was in college, there was a uh, teacher who I helped her edit her doctorate. Mm -hmm. I was a student, but I helped her edit her doctorate. And, um, she went and asked, could I take over her class while she went to defend it? So she had four college classes. The college agreed because they knew me. I was a Phi Theta Kappa, and I was also the Scholar Bowl uh, uh, team captain at that time. And so I slicked up my hair, put on my khakis, and I came in. I took over her college classes. And with a real teacher sitting in the back, you know, for legal, 
but I did it. And uh, then whenever the it was over, the uh, head of the school, who was the, on the last day, the one that sat there and listened to me, he said, what is your degree going to be? And I said, education. He said, come see me. You've got a job. You know, it's something that I do well. And when I'm working with a group dynamic, I will start, let's say 30, like in your situation, I will start out by uh -huh. talking and I'm talking to the back row, not the front row. I want to talk to the back row. I acknowledge the front row, but I'm talking to the back row. And then as I do my bit, I will throw out little questions and things, funny little anecdotes or whatever. And I will judge the reaction of individuals, how mm -hmm. in depth they are to what I'm saying. The ones that I'm losing, I will start directing a little to. It's kind of like a, a conductor. I'm listening to the whole audience, see? And I focus on that kid in the back corner that I can tell he's just, okay, he's one of the ones that's either lost or bored, see? And quickly, I figure out how to do that. I want to take the advanced ones and bring them into the conversation because they already have knowledge, see? And they're bored, so I want to bring them just a little bit, not let them take over, but just a little bit in. Likewise, those over here that are a little bit lost in it, I want to break it down. I had a very good teacher in, in a high school called Mrs. Whittle. She was a biology teacher. She had, I think, two PhDs and was a fantastic teacher. She taught a mm -hmm. topic that was rather dry. And mm -hmm. so she would do incredibly stupid things to get your attention and keep your attention. So for example, she drug this big boulder. Her room was full of all kinds of things. She drew this big boulder out in the middle of the room and stood on it on one foot with this teeter totter as she detailed to us RNA, even 40 years later. And I asked this of our 30 year class reunion. We remember it. Most of us can still even recite what it was because <laughs> it was so ludicrous what she was saying, but the fact of it stuck. She was connecting with the students, see. And so I learned from her as a teacher on how to get those students invested into it. You know, I want, yeah, of course you got the ones in the front that's the higher grade, the A students and stuff like that. I want to get them throwing a little stuff in, but I also want that back row throwing stuff in. If I can get the back row throwing questions and the front row throwing answers, I get everybody is part of this teaching thing. I'm not the only voice. It's mm -hmm. a chorus then, you see. And that's my mindset when I approach a group in whatever professional, if I'm walking into a boardroom back in the day or whatever, I'm going to get the whole room engrossed in what we're talking about. And if I have the couple over here that's becomes the problem child. They're either bored or <laughs> they're advanced. So I'll see them individually and find out how I can work them in. See, when I was in high school ROTC, they gave me the screw up platoon. I asked for it. With me, I could get them on board and they became the best uh, marked platoon four months later. They just needed different leadership, a little more focused a little more bringing them in. Don't yell at them. Be with them. And uh, ROTC taught me a lot on how to be a teacher and a leader. So you were formerly educated in being a teacher. Did you ever finish your education degree? Uh, not anything big. <laughs> no, I, I never got anything big. But no? <laughs> I was working a full-time job as a district manager while I was putting myself through college and uh, doing it for my own mu amusement more than anything else. But my background is history and education. Well, we share that together, man. Cool. <laughs> so you, speaking of history, uh, those of you who follow Blackie, you are probably well aware because he sprinkles little facts about himself here and there in his videos. But he is, or he, at least he was, a living historian. Mm -hmm. At one point, he every once in a while, he'll bring out his tin cup or some other artifact <laughs> from his days reenacting and stuff. What got you started in that? Oh, boy. Um, one, Davy Crockett. Two, in, uh, I want to say it was like 1981 or 1982, 
Sports Afield uh, did a article on the Western Rendezvous. I did not know any such thing existed. Okay. And that just kicked me off. And then uh, 1984, I went to my first large rendezvous, which was the Southeastern Rendezvous in Demopolis, Alabama. That's where I met Grouch, my great mentor. And uh, that started it. And for 25 years, I did living history. I started out in the mountain man era, researching it. And then bit by bit, I kept walking backwards, you know, and then I was war of 1812 for a little bit. And then I was uh, post-revolutionary war, revolutionary war. And then finally I ended up really about 1750s uh, is where I'd got. And the group that I was part of, we called ourselves the, uh, Alabama pre-1840 Historical Society, and we put on the Southeastern Rendezvous for the National Muzzleloading Rifle Association. I forget how many times, but from 1990 until 2000, I think every year, either we were putting it on or we were the dog soldiers working it on site. Right. So 10 years of putting on National Rendezvous. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> You ever go back and visit every once in a while? I the a couple of years ago I went back to a local one that I was part of the Whitewater Long Hunters that I was part of, and uh, I went and camped out with them a couple of times. And it's it's not that I lost interest in it, but to be honest, I was the baby of the bunch. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was there in the early nine eight, late eighties, early nineties. Um, it was like a high water mark and. I'll tell you this, show you how they were. Some dude showed up at one of our big events wearing a breech clout and fruit of the looms. <laughs> and we chased him down to cut the fruit of the looms off. You're either going to wear the breech clout or not. You know, we were, you know, everybody was so stickler for historic accuracy. And uh, then by the end of it, so many people had got so old, they were using hibachis because they really couldn't build a fire anymore. Uh, and it, just, it got sad to me. You know, I'd had so many good times, so many good friends, and I'd lost so many good friends um, that I just, it was better to leave it and move on. Yeah. Here in Ohio, I mean, living history as a whole has kind of decreased. Uh, World War I or World War II, even Vietnam is actually starting mm -hmm. to kind of increase and grow. But here in Ohio, uh, the rendezvous are still holding on, but they're a heck of a lot smaller. But the old areas are still frequented, which is comforting to see because uh, those things are just so fun to go to, man. <laughs> just, oh, yeah. And it's a family atmosphere. The biggest one I ever went to was the Eastern in uh, West Virginia. And there was 50,000 people at that one. At a rendezvous? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I don't think there was that many at the 140th Gettysburg I went to. <laughs> uh, there was 50, th uh, 50 at the high water mark of the week. If you added it up, it, it stayed around 46. But if you added up everybody that only could come in for two days and everything, total admission was 50, a little over 50,000. The gentleman run it, running it was named Blizzard. And uh, the day we they opened the gates... They broke even, which means they had all the money to hand back to the national. And so from that point forward, it was all profit. They gave the money back. They brought in, I think, 20 or 22 buffalo that had been butchered. And they put these big, huge grates on these big blocks. And I forget how many cords of wood and cooked 20 buffalo. At one time, they used pitchforks for the meat. <laughs> and then as the meat got done, they would just, you know, ring this bell and people would go take hunks to take back to eat. So they had horses uh, drawing wagons. That's how you got in and out of camp. It was awesome. It truly was. You know, I, I got to know a lot of people, a lot of fairly famous people and uh, really, really enjoyed doing my living history. Wow. You think you might ever get back into it sometime? Uh, living history in general. I have thought about it. I really have. Um, however, the time period that you like and the, the Kephart type in the early 1900s is interesting to me because a lot of the gear 
that y'all are using, I saw and I remember, but I remember it as just being the stuff that the old people had. <laughs> you know, uh, there was a pocket watch alarm clock. It was the size of a pocket watch. And you press thing and it popped up and then you stood the, the actual watch up, okay, and leaned it back and you could set the time and it was a little bitty alarm clock. And that was from like 1910. And uh, it had been carried in the uh, breast pocket of a uh, surveyor that was the father of a lady I knew in the 60s, her father. And he used it to wake him up because he had to do so many miles, you know, and they actually just stayed out there surveying these huge tracts of timber. They'd be like wow. a 30 mile square, you know. And uh, so your turn is 2 a.m. You get up, you know, and so he had to have a pocket watch. And that was in the early, early 20. It was World War One had just ended, you know. And uh, but I remember the tin cups. I remember McClellan saddles. Uh, <laughs> Civil War era haversack still hanging on nails in barns. You know, I saw that stuff. You know, if you look up the last surviving Confederate widow, it was here in Alabama, not far from me. And she died in the 80s, you know. So th that stuff still existed. The old, old cavalry gear and stuff like that. I learned to ride on a McClellan saddle when I was a kid because it was an old surplus that somebody had bought from the Army back probably about 1900. Yeah. Be yeah. like Bannermans or something. Yeah. And that's cool. I I was like hearing stories of the uh, first generation. They're not really the first per se, but the first generation of Civil War reenactors who really made it big in the, the bicentennial and stuff in the 60s. Like these guys were still putting on original uniforms and using original cartridge boxes and the original rifles and stuff. And, and they were just going through the mud and the dirt and rough and tumble. I was like, oh, my gosh, all those artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at it this way. From right now to 1950 was the same time period from me to the Civil War when I was born. Whoa. That does put click, it in perspective. Click. Yeah. So there were people in their 90s who had been, you know, let's say they were 20 in, in 1870. 30 years, they'd be 50 in 1900. 30 years, they'd be in their 80s in the, around World War II. Right. So, and so that's the fathers of many of my friends and grandfathers that they learned from. So when I'm talking about, I saw Civil War knapsacks, yeah, they were still being used, you know. Uh, Trapdoor 4570. I helped a gentleman handload for it when I was a teenager. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, he wanted to hunt rabbits with it. <laughs> and we loaded it with uh, uh, 20 grains of black powder, a wadded up newspaper stuffed in, and then a round ball that was really meant to go into a cap and ball revolver, thumb pressed in the end of it. You would take a nail and punch out the primer. We would put the new primer in by thumb, set it on top of a uh, a uh, heavy washer on a stump, run a wood stick down and tap the primer in place. That's how we reloaded them. And with that weak load, it shot about like a 410 shotgun. He could shoot rabbits and squirrels with it. So you, you were into cap and ball revolvers. One of my viewers specifically wanted to know what really got you into the cap and ball revolver. Oh, um a good friend of mine, when I was 12, inherited from his uncle, who had passed away, a 51 Navy and a Spiller and Burr. And I horse traded him out of the Spiller and Burr. And I already had a background in, in handguns and rifles and shotguns by that age. But it was the first black powder gun I'd ever had. I saw them in movies, you know, and read about them in the books, but never had them. It was only many years later I found out that that was an original Spiller and Burr. We thought it was a replica. It was several years later that I found out it was actually an original. 
Oh, wow. And uh, he kept the 51 Navy, which was a Navy arms reproduction. And so I had me, you know, he, hey, figure it out. So I had to figure out where to get powder and cap and ball. And then I bought my own for another one from Otasco. And that's what got me into it. You know, I was too young legally to have a handgun, but I could have a cap and ball revolver. <laughs> and I, I still have that gun. And I have hunted, used it. Um, I've wore the gun out from sheer age, you know. So, yeah just got into it, fell in love with it, knew the history. And I never really did civil war reenactment. I knew about it, but I just never got into it. I was mountain man, Aaron back, but my cousin was big into the civil war and he kept bugging me to come to the event, hang up a shingle and do gunsmithing. You actually know how to work on these guns, you know, and I just, yeah, never going to do it. I may get into that one day. I may do like you said, hang up a shingle and just be a gunsmith at a Civil War reenactment and fix guns. <laughs> Being in Alabama, I'm surprised that uh, that's not an era that you got into. You would think, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm an hour and a half away from the Gulf Coast, and I don't care nothing about the beach. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. the mountain. Now, that's interesting. Beach, nah, not me. <laughs> Hi, friends. I've got an exciting opportunity. I cannot wait to share with you. In 2024, we're going to host the inaugural historic squirrel camp at the Pathfinder School here in southeastern Ohio, owned by the one and only Dave Canterbury. I'm really excited to work with Dave Canterbury and the Pathfinder School in this great opportunity just to get together with a bunch of like-minded folks who enjoy camping and outdoor adventure, adventure and hunting. Now, if you're not a hunter, don't worry. You don't have to be. You can still come and uh, sit around the campfire and enjoy the good company and the canvas tents and the equipment of the yesteryear. Since it is a historic event, this is a living history event, but it's not open to the public. It is exclusive to living historians. If you don't consider yourself a living historian, if this would be your first event, consider taking the time you know, between now and 2024, October, to get together your equipment. All you have to have is equipment that dates between 1910 and 1938. Any firearm that was patented and used before 1938 is successful. So that gives you plenty of opportunity to get here together and hopefully join us around the campfire for this awesome weekend adventure. The details are going to come out as they are developed. Make sure to subscribe to this channel at uh, Honorable Outfitters or Campfire Chats with Honorable Outfitters if you're on the podcast listener. And if you want all the nitty-gritty details of how it develops, then please consider joining the email newsletter. The email newsletter link can be found in the description box or in the show notes. You won't want to miss this awesome opportunity. Really excited. So I hope to see you around the campfire, and uh, thank you for considering and joining me on this adventure where we talk campcraft and outdoors. How has uh, your interest in history influenced uh, you going into campcraft or bushcrafting? Ooh, um, I got into it because of Dave Canterbury, to be honest. Okay. Um, I had a background in rendezvousing and living history, and I actually got to meet Dave Canterbury when he was a reenactor. <gasps> no kidding. We were, on opposite, we were on opposite sides of a tactical and met and I pointed that out to him about 93 is when I actually met him the first time. And then years later, um, I was looking on YouTube and I stumbled upon one of his videos. And back in those days when he was starting out, he would issue these challenges to his followers and you had to do a video to respond. And the first one I did was to build a debris hut with a knife. You had to pick some sort of knife or cutting tool. And I had picked a K-bar because I thought we were going to be making a bow. Mm -hmm. I hadn't. I took my kukri. But <laughs> I played fair. And so when he dumped it on us, said, oh, you got to build a debris shelter. And so that was my very first video. I shot it. Had to get a friend of mine to show me how to make a, a, a photography camera do video. Mm-hmm. And uh, I shot it and put it out as a response to that. And people went asking questions. And I would shoot another video to answer their question. And that's how it happened. That started in 2008. 
And uh, my whole channel started because of that, of people asking me questions. And I would make a video to answer the question. I kind of came into it like a back door, really. I wasn't starting out to do bushcraft. It's just I had wood skills. My background is a woodsman, hunter, fisherman. I had living history. And I had some military training. I wasn't in the military, but I had some military training. And so those all kind of just blurred together. And I just saw bushcraft as another form of living history rendezvous. It's just we're first generation. Someday they'll be reenacting us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, isn't that something to think about? <laughs> you know, that's something that's actually connected a lot of bushcrafters, at least YouTube bushcrafters that I've, I'm finding out. I, I knew Dave was, and I knew that you were, and I found out that coal cracker, uh, Dan Womack, mm -hmm. he, he was also into yeah. long hunting and living history. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, I, I'm seeing these trends all around, like the, especially the best YouTube camp crafters, bush crafters, or whatever you want to call yourself, like are the ones who have that kind of experience who are familiar with public education. And mm -hmm. honestly, like you're paying money to do living history. You're volunteering your time, your money, your equipment, like all this stuff. And you're doing it just to pass on the love of something that you do. And it totally comes through. And all of those bush crafters that have that same kind of background. So it's beautiful mm -hmm. that you and Dave share that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. especially that, that experience. It's another thing of, if you go and do, let's say, um, cross country skiing, mm -hmm. there are all kinds of sites. You can get all the skis, all the gear. Here's all your equipment all laid out for you. Just insert money. When you're doing living history, it may or may not be available and you've got to fabricate it. And Amen. so my grandmother taught me how to sew as a child. And so I had to make my own, a lot of times, I couldn't afford it. So I made my own rendezvous gear. I built my own rifle. I made my own haversack. You know, I made my own backpack. Um, and that hands-on experimental archaeology of you'd see it in a book and go, what did that do? And so you, but once you made it, you go, oh, I see. Yeah, now, I, then it started clicking. Um, and then you step over into bushcraft. We're kind of like the idea guys where, well, there isn't a such and such. Oh, really? Well, we can, you know, uh, very much in your time period. That's what they were doing. Camping was a new concept because they had done what we would call camping. But that was just traveling. Mm -hmm. You went by horse, you went by wagon, you, you got to remember the first cars didn't even have windows in them. It was the same as sitting in a wagon. You know, you're just sitting there bundled up in a driving rainstorm. That's how you travel. Um, and because of that, they had to create everything from scratch, just about. And they had a lot of military surplus they could play with. Um, I have given an idea of the scouts, the scout mess kit. Okay. If you look at the U.S. Cavalry Museum, you'll see one of those. 1878, it was a forager's set that was issued out so that they would have a pot, a fry pan, and etc. Mm -hmm. One in a squad. Remember the old meat can they had? Right, right. Well, there was, that's the forager set. Well, when the Boy Scouts came around, those were surplus. That's where they got it. It was a U.S. Cavalry set that was patented on a British set, actually. But they don't talk about that. You just always call it the Boy Scout set. Right. You know, but it was all steel. It was tin pots, you know. And so uh, you'll know the one I'm talking about. I think you've even done one of it. A, uh, it's a mess kit that is a canteen, and there's a clamshell that comes over the canteen. Probably sitting right there. Yeah. What is the name of it? That's the Preston mess kit. Preston. Yes. I think that would be an awesome mess kit for today. You know, maybe if we could get it made out of modern materials, maybe titanium, it would probably sell, you know, in our environment. But like you said, in me watching other channels 
uh, and I don't, to be honest, I don't watch as many channels as you think. Me generating my content is enough work. <laughs> so, but looking out and the ones that got a lot of real life experience of doing it, that usually comes across. And and not bad mouthing anybody. I don't in any way that way. But a lot of people that they're coming from, they got into it as a hobby. It's kind of like the ski guys. They're buying gear, mm -hmm. and it's experimentation with the gear. But they don't have the deep background of having no gear and having to create gear and experiment with. Can I take a tin can and make it into a skillet? Can I make it into a baker? Can I whatever? Because that's what I got, you know. And you see that a lot in early scouts of them taking them number 10, 10 cans and making cups, making everything out of them cans because they were everywhere. They were plentiful. And a pair of 10 snips, a hammer, and a couple of nails and a stick, you can make a skillet out of it. Right. That's one of the things I like about the old uh, scout manuals. Is if you look at them, they have patterns and instructions on how to make your haversack, how to make your pack, or how to make a tent mm -hmm. even. So they, they really did encourage. And... You know, your average kid, they didn't have the money to go out and spend stuff. So you got to get creative. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that independence, I think, is uh, kind of lost on uh, the, the program today to an extent. We won't get into well, that. It is, <laughs> it is because um, many of the experimentations in living history, et cetera, there is a need that none of these pieces of kit truly fit and you're using this need enough that you want an improvement right that's what inspires this new whatever to come in uh, most people don't camp enough uh they go a couple times a year uh they never really get into it uh in living history i mean you could tell the guys that were serious because they had dirty knees. <laughs> they had ground in dirt in the elbows. I mean, stained clothing. They weren't doing it for show. They had wore it in all the conditions and it had took on that patina by natural use, you know. And then the guy that walk up with the brand new, everything shiny, beautiful. And you knew this guy, got, he got money, but he ain't got a clue. You know, we call them store bought. <laughs> so you bring me up to my my next question for you. Do you consider yourself, in the purest form, a wood crafter, a bush crafter, a camp crafter, or some other crafter? <laughs> if I was going to, I'm a woodsman. Okay, that means I have a skill set that's focused on the eastern woodlands of the United States, predominantly the Southern. So I deal with a lot of heat. So a lot of my stuff is related around, you'll hear me talk about insects, skeeters, snakes, everything else in my environment. If I was a plainsman, you don't hear that term much anymore, but those are people that are out in the Great Plains, you know, they have their own skill sets. Um, then there were mountain men, that was high altitude mountains and they're specific skill sets. Mm -hmm. uh, how about a swamper? They <laughs> yeah. have specific skill sets in the swamp or somebody down yonder in the, in the bayous or somebody in, in the keys who thrives off of shallow bays and stuff like that. If I was going to put myself into a category, I'm a woodsman and our kind of text, I would say I'm a woods crafter because I function in woods, not the bush. Uh, which is European, and I know where that topic came from, but I'm predominantly a woods crafter, and I am a woodsman is how I would label myself. I just had to ask that because even in living history and reenactments, you have all these different levels. You have mainstream, you have progressive, you have authentic campaigner, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems like in every subculture mm -hmm. there is, there's some type of, it's not, and it, I don't like putting it as a hierarchy, but there's people who tend to fall in one area or the next just based off of how much time or commit money they want to commit to it and mm -hmm. uh, maybe a particular focus. And I think people can give each other a bad reputation if you're not a bushcrafter 
Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't do this, this, or this, or, or whatever, if you don't demonstrate this or this or this. So I, I find labels as kind of a, a sticky and messy situation in general, yeah. but it's just nice to kind of identify for yourself, not anybody else, not for anybody else, mm -hmm. but just identify for yourself, like what is your specialty? So thank you for kind of clearing that up. And mm -hmm. as a woodsman, like how, how often do you go camping now every year? This, this year I made uh, my new year's resolution that I was going to camp every month, at least two days. Well, I have greatly exceeded that. I've had four events that were a week um, thus far. So I try to camp out at least once a month, sometimes twice and three times. When the weather's good, um, I'm not in fantastic health. I have heart issues. I'm in my 60s. I'm just flat wore out. And so the doctor doesn't want me out in extreme heat. And being in the lower south, that means summer gets kind of sketchy. Or being in extreme cold, it's not the fact I can't take the cold. It's when you're laying there trying to stay warm and your heart's beating like crazy trying right. to keep you warm when it's 20 degrees. Uh, both of those are kind of no-nos for me. So I try to go every month at least, sometimes three or four days in a month. Um, and I go out at least three or four times a week to the woods either to shoot my videos or just to go and be me, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's, it's part of me. I don't like being indoors that much. And, uh, I, I realize that not everybody has that option. Not everybody has it, but for me, that's where I'm the most comfortable is out there. And as a, as a reenactor, you'll understand this. When we went to rendezvous, and you were in rendezvous any amount of time, sooner or later, you're going to do something stupid mm -hmm. and you're going to get a nickname. <laughs> yep. And then we're going to stop calling you by your real name. And we're only going to call you by that nickname. Well, that's very liberating because now when you would show up at one of these events, we don't talk about what we do back in the real world. Right. You're you. <laughs> All those tears and things like you talk about the society puts that, He's a garbage truck operator. He's a Supreme Court justice. He's a doctor. He works for sanitation or he works as a clerk. That goes away. It's who you are. See? And um, I had a guy that I camp with. We just stumble into each other at events for a couple of years there. And uh, I called him bad leg because he always limped. And here he was, he had a big old gruffy beard and everything. I thought he was a biker or something, you know, but we got along great, you know, uh, I, you know, me and bad leg did fine. And then an event, something happened at an event and, uh, bad leg reached into his pocket and pulled out his ID and he was the head of the FBI in that state. I didn't <laughs> know he was the head of the FBI in that state, you know, I'm like, right. you're kidding me. You know, but uh, you can be yourself. And so coming into to woodscraft, you know, it's you, your ability, your skills. You know, be who you are, not what society says over here, what you have to do for a living over there. Be who you are, you know, and that's my approach to it. And that's what I encourage people to get into it how freeing it is, you know, to take gear that you like, that knife you really like, that pack you really like, to wander through the woods, to fish, hunt, just camp out, cook on a fire, learn how to carve a spoon, whatever. It's, it's our way of stepping out of the real world, which to me is the fake world, and stepping into the real world of who are you? What do you enjoy? What are your passions? What are your interests? You know, what part of history do you like? What part of gear? You know, are you a knife nut? Do you think I'm um, haversacks man or sleeping bags, whatever? <laughs> what is it that you're passionate about? To be out here? Maybe it's bird watching, whatever. And uh, it's a big enough field for everybody. 
It really is. You know, just because I'm into camp cooking and you're into uh, trees and dendrology, we can camp together. You know, we can still work around a fire together, do everything. I play cook, you go find a tree. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be. Everybody here is into cross-country skiing. We're going to be wearing the same packs, the same skis, so you don't interfere with everybody else. That, that's rather limiting to me. I'd rather be something like this where you can be you, whoever you are. It's very liberating for sure. And I think you are serving, uh, well, I mean, you're serving everybody, but you have more recently really tried to serve the older population. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's so sad for me, whenever I see um, uh, reenactors who feel like they're so old that they're no good on the field anymore, so they just leave altogether. They just pack up everything. It's like, no, 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 no. You can still come out and camp with us. And it's sad that there's the older population who feel that they can't get out and they're going to be excluded because their health's not a particular way. They're not able to hike as far or whatever. You are serving that population and that's, that's still needed. That knowledge is still needed. Those skills are still needed. And just their friendship and camaraderie is still needed. And I, I appreciate mm -hmm. you really trying to get those guys back out in the woods where they, where they belong we, and they feel happy. We have a saying in my family, those who can do, those who cannot teach. So like my friend Dan Lutz, he broke his back uh -huh. in an industrial accident. He felt like the world is over. He'll never work again and everything. And we became friends. And it's like, I just, I just can't work a nine to five anymore. I said, you've got 40 years experience as a trapper. In Ohio, you were making $50,000 a year as a side job trapping in Ohio. And you don't think that's worth anything. Dude, teach. <laughs> oh, nobody's going to want it. The heck they ain't. You know how you can sit on your butt on that stump and teach. And that's exactly the, the way I view it. I mean, the, the silver wolves are the experience. You know, we need them to tell those stories, to inspire the next generation, to help us not make the same mistake they made. Amen. You know, we're going to make mistakes. That's life. But figuring out not to stick a butter knife into a light socket, we only had to do that once. <laughs> you know. Having someone that's been there, done that with real world experience, sitting there explaining to you how to do your bedroll so when you're in a driving rain, it don't get wet inside. Right. Of how to cross a creek, you know, how to come up with water that you know alligators are down here. How do I avoid stepping on a gator or going to cross where I got gators? What I know to look for, you know bears how do i deal with this in bear country that is real world experience they are the college professors of woodscraft remember what uh Kephart said that there is no graduation in the school of woodsy knowledge well these are the seniors of the school they should be the one that just come out and sit and talk you ain't got to be the one leading the charge sit and talk when we did the silver wolves our oldest student was 85 the average age was like 68 you know many of them having professional careers and everything else but one of them this was his very first camp out he ever used a hammock you know and it worked he said this is going up in the house <laughs> you know it, it, it was so comfortable compared to laying on the ground or laying on a cot he said, this is more comfortable than my bed, you know, and they can do it, you know, just get out there and do it. You've got the knowledge, you know, that's the reason of my whole channel. Everything is what's in here 
doesn't belong to me. It was given to me by these old silver wolves who took the time to spend time as a snot-nosed little kid with 10,000 questions that couldn't shut up asking about Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett and what did you do in the war and how do you clean a hog? And that was me. So my job now, my legacy, is to get as much of this out there as I can to pass it on. So hopefully someone seeing this will find some little tidbit and they learn and then they can pass it on. Well, I got to say, uh, you uh, had a, a, have had a serious impact on my knowledge and, and uh, inspired me quite a bit. There's a, another YouTuber and uh, he was my mentor in this living history aspect of early 20th century, uh, Sarge Vining. He's got a YouTube channel too, but I'm familiar guys, with him and guys like you and him leading people that are younger than you uh-huh. is going to have that ripple effect. Uh, just this past mm-hmm. weekend, I was at a living history at the Ohio historic society and I was mm-hmm. doing an, a post world war two event, living history event. And I wouldn't have been there were it not really for you, Sarge Vining, Dave Canterbury, and a couple others, and your guys' inspiration. And it just so happened, I was really excited. There's there's this guy and his wife I was talking to, showing him my, my scouting display. And just as he's leaving out of my, my house, uh, his wife, I don't remember what I said to spark him, but his wife said, well, he was a scout there in the 1940s. I was like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. You were actually like... You were a Boy Scout in 1940s? Yeah. And he's like, yeah. I was like, oh, man, come here, come here. How how am I doing? Like, <laughs> how close to the reality am I? Yeah. And it just opened a whole door. But I would never have had that little bit of experience were it not for, for you, Sarge Valle, and a couple other people. I would not be able to tell that story and t- tell my experience to the scouts mm-hmm. in my troop or, or my students, even in my middle school if it weren't not for guys like you. So thank you very much for learning, listening, you know, and more important, taking it and running with it on your own. It's, it's awesome, man. It's a, it's a great adventure. So you, you've kind of touched on this whole idea of community. We've talked about, um, people can be just themselves in the Mm -hmm. woods. And I know you run, or at least you help run and, and you attend a lot of bushcraft camps and gatherings mm-hmm. and stuff. In your experience and from what you've seen in your life, do you think that those kind of events may morph or at least offer opportunities into like camping clubs, kind of like how we have reenactment groups or units? Absolutely. Um, I was just at Georgia Bushcraft last weekend or weekend before it all starts running together guys and um (laughs) you had such a wide diversity of people um all ages all ethnicities everything mixed in there i had a wonderful uh one back in the spring where i was uh one of the instructors there needed some wood split up they had some fat wood, but it was in fairly large planks. And I said, bring it up. We'll, we'll grab it. And I whipped out my kukri and got a stump, got to bust it. Well, that turned into an impromptu class on how to use a kukri. <laughs> um, but I had uh, Asian people, uh, African-American people. I had 20-year-olds, 50-year-olds. I mean, everybody come up and wanted to know because they were interested in getting into camping. See? Um, it is not something that's just one little niche, you know, um, and like you were saying earlier, you would think me being down here in the South, it would have been a, it would have been a civil war reenactment (laughs) that I would have got into because I'm surrounded by monuments. I'm surrounded by everything down here. Um, but it wasn't, it was this other stuff that pulled me in. And the next generations that I'm seeing coming up that are learning from this box, you know, from their phone, we have a voice that we never had before Mm -hmm. where I, I, 
I'm not doing it to toot my own horn, but here I got 85,000 followers. And according to my demographics, only 20% of people who watch my video are subscribed. So that's 420 something thousand people that watch Blackie. You know, I have had people from all over the world uh, contact me and show me videos of where they've taken something I've said. And so Brazil, Sweden, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Austria, Mexico, um, Alaska, Russia. That was a fun one. This guy kept sending me stuff and I had to take him, put it into Bible fish because it was in Cyrillic and it turned out he's in Russia, you know? <laughs> and so it's universal what we're doing. That's one of the reasons you see so many of the, uh, the videos coming out of Sweden and, and Europe where they don't talk. They just do everything in front of you because then there's no language barrier. You can just watch them. See? And uh, I think that we're, we are starting something like those people in the early 1900s that said, hey, let's go camping, not because we got to, but it's fun. Right. You know, <laughs> when Ford came up with a camper set to go on to the Model T and the Model A, you know, who would have thought, you know, um, Nesmunk writing about it. He was writing about what he thought was a vanishing era that he thought this was all going to be gone soon and no one would ever know about any of this stuff. And yet he began what really in many ways is the ultralight movement and modern backpacking him and then beard. And of course the scouts and everything else who would have thought that one young scout in the fog in London would cause that guy to start scouting in America. A kid at night guiding that guy who was lost in the fog. You don't know. We're, and I, I mentioned this at Georgia Bushcraft. Don't do a video for the masses. Do that video for that 10 people. That it's really going to click. Do the depth. Explain it like you're talking to somebody that you know, talking to your daughter, your son, your brother, whatever, because you don't know what you're going to say is going to be that tick that really sets them off on their own adventure. Um, the masses, they'll do what they want. They're doing it for amusement just to watch it. That's great. Very tickled and glad to have them. It's that kid sitting in the big city that never sees trees or grass that watches my videos and then gets out on the barbecue grill and practices building a fire and starts building the skills like I did where they weren't ever going to take me camping. I had to learn. See, that's, that's the next generation. That's what's coming is hopefully that all these, these various sites, this information is one day going to be cataloged into something for a generation to look at, you know, maybe a hundred years after we're gone, somebody will be coming back and playing our videos, you know, to talk about Nesmunk, like we talk about Nesmunk or Beard or et cetera. Maybe they'll be talking about Dave Canterbury or talking about Cold Cracker or, or Sarge, you know, um, of course of Kephart and et cetera. We don't know what's going to happen in the next century. Hopefully it'll be something good. Amen. I like that nugget that you gave where you said, uh, if you're going to do this, talk to somebody, talk to the 10. I really like that. Just oh, talk to yeah. those 10 and talk to them in depth, not just to gloss over some things, but you actually teach mm -hmm. that, uh, that says a lot about the quality of a person that you are, sir. I think so. <laughs> anyway. Thank you very much. So I, I know I, I don't want to take up too much of your time because we're already past an hour and this has been such an awesome conversation. So I'm, I've had some questions though from my viewers that I, I wanted to make sure that got out there sure. for you. Go ahead. And I know you're a big knife guy. You just mentioned your Kikuri. Uh, <laughs> one of the questions was, what is your favorite 
small knife? Is it a folder or is it like a sheath knife? What's your favorite small knife? My favorite small knife um, would probably be, if we're talking custom, it's the WCNK neck knife. Okay. Most people can't afford that. <laughs> if I was going to pick another small knife, it would be the Mora. Uh, the red handle round body Mora. Uh-huh. That's, that was my first official bushcraft knife. And I'm very, very enamored with it. Still have it. Yes, I went and got a lot bigger and better knives, but I still got that knife and I still use it. And it'd be a very good first choice to begin with. And it's, it's economical. And when you're starting out, you're going to make mistakes and I would rather you screw up a $20 knife than a $200 knife. True. Especially sharpening. it. Oh yeah. <laughs> Mess up a knife real quick. If you're not used to sharpening mm -hmm. what, uh, or how, how do you clean military canteens? Cause you mentioned military surplus and I know you've talked previously about using, mm -hmm. you know, your jackets and the ponchos, like you're really, um, good about pushing economical options and military surplus is certainly economical, mm -hmm. but canteens, especially if you're a soldier, you know what some soldiers do with the canteens. How do you clean them out personally? Okay. If it's a metal canteen, like a world war two or an old boy scout metal canteen or something like that. First thing I want to do is I want to fill it up with hot tap water, let it sit overnight. If there's anything dried in there, I want it to hydrate to get it out easier. Okay. Then I'm going to pour that water out, fill it back up halfway, put my thumb in the hole or cap it off with a rag and shake it up, let it knock stuff loose. After that, I'm going to probably pour like a shot glass worth of table salt in there and put like half the canteen full of hot tap water and sit there and swirl it. Let that salt scour the inside. Hmm. It'll also if anything live in there. The salt water will kill it, you know, or at least especially mold and stuff really don't like high salt content. Get that out and then a look in the hole with a bright light and see if I can see anything. Fill it full of clear water and give it two or three days. Pour it into a clear glass. Is the water tainted in any way? If it's not, then there's nothing in there contaminating it. Smell it. Is there any smell of petroleum? Did somebody use this to carry gasoline or something? Or something like that. Cast iron small pots. Be sure somebody didn't melt lead in it. You know, look at it real good. Make sure there's nothing in the little cracks. You'll never get the lead out. Heat it up to hot. And if it does, do you see that silvery stuff come out of the stuff? That means lead. Get rid of it. You don't know what this canteen has done or this cooking set or this mess kit in the last hundred years because it may have been real valuable or it may have been the piece of junk they used to whatever, you know. Right. Um, and so you just got to be suspect of it until you verify it. Then, of course, if I pour that water out, like I said, and it's clear, then I'll go with a little bit of like a uh, four drops of uh, bleach fill it full of water, let that sit for a couple of minutes and then rinse it out really, really, really good. And then I will test it again. No smell, no nothing. I'll take a little sip, swish it around in my mouth. Do I taste any off taste of any kind? If not, I'll try the canteen. Man, you know, thank you. I know that's in depth, but it's because of I've ran across, you know, I had a World War II canteen I got one time. I just rinsed it out, filled it up. And I went to play with it because I thought I had found something. And I got so sick. <laughs> and we found out afterwards that it had been in the barn and he had put pesticides in that thing to pour into his sprayer. Remember the old metal pump up sprayers? Yeah. We would go down to the co-op and they had these big tanks of it, like drums of it. And so he'd fill up a canteen and fill up that. And that was the canteen that had pesticides in it. Oh my gosh. Like <laughs> So I got super sick. I was just super lucky that I was able to flush it out of me. But uh, after that, I became real interested. Plastic canteens, U.S. military type stuff. 
using the hot tap water and stuff and salt uh, works. If you look inside and there's a lot of scale in it, go to the store, get the Daisy Steel BBs. They'll be the silver colored. Don't get the copper color ones because that's actually a copper wash and that might come off on the inside. The steel one is just steel BBs. Pour those in and start swirling them around with a little bit of table salt and a little bit of water. And that will scour the inside and you knock stuff, the oxidation off the inside. Awesome. Thank you for that. So I, mm -hmm. I want to invite you to uh, an event that's coming that's here in Ohio, actually at Dave Canterbury's Pathfinder School. Because after I interviewed Dave, he got a hold of me and he invited me to, to host it at his property. We're doing a historic themed uh, squirrel hunt. So mm. if you have gear, like equipment, you know, you probably still have your old tent, I'm sure, <laughs> somewhere. I'm sure you got an mm. old uh, rendezvous tent tucked away. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> you come to that the last weekend of October. And I'll, I'll post the, uh, the info on Bannerman's, of course. And I think you're a member yeah, of a couple you know. other groups, I man. That. But it's, it's going to be great, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'll keep you updated with that. But um, Mr. Blackie, Mr. Thomas, I, I really appreciate you coming on and spending time with me tonight and uh, talking you know, for an hour and a half almost and, and just loading us down with all this information, all this knowledge and just like your, your history, your background. And I hope it really does reach somebody out there and encourages them to get outside, kind of follow your same path, especially since you said yourself, you didn't have any real formal training and camping. You just mm -hmm. kind of went out and did it. You just, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. I know my viewers will appreciate it. And I, I'm sure this will reach a lot of people that, or is on your channel as well. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. All right. So everybody, uh, we're going ahead and uh, take it from there. I, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Give a kiss and hug to your loved ones, and we will catch you guys next time. Make sure to check out Blackie Thomas on YouTube and check out all of his uh, websites and everything else. He's on everything. Just look up Blackie Thomas. He's world famous. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.